Good morning. Welcome to Plymouth Sunday Forum. Um, this morning, the artistic director, Marcella Lorca from 10,000 Things is speaking. Okay. And I'm going to start over because I don't think you could hear me. Um, this morning, the artistic director of 10,000 Things, Marcella, Marcella Lorca, is speaking with us. And um, if you haven't seen, I think a lot of people at Plymouth have seen 10,000 Things, but you haven't. If you haven't, it's an incredible experience. And um, I'm a big fan. So I'm really happy <laughs> Marcella's here today and give us kind of the behind the scenes, you know, look at creating a performance. And uh, Marcella, I mean, she is so incredibly accomplished. In, she has a long resume in Minneapolis. She has a long resume nationally. And we're lucky to have her here today. So just a few items. Um, if you have, we'll have, Marcella will, will speak and then we'll have time for questions at the end, which she's very much looking forward to. Um, and if you're remote, uh, please use the Q&A and type your questions or raise your hand um, and we can turn your, you know, turn your speaker on and you will also have to turn your speaker on. Um, if you have a technical issue, please use the chat. And I think that's everything. We're ready to go. Here's Marcella. Thank you. And good morning, everybody. And thanks for coming. And uh, thanks for you who are viewing at home. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, this church has become a bit of a home for us recently because we've been rehearsing and performing. This is our second project that we have uh, now with Thunder Knocking on the Door. And uh, the first one was Comedy of Errors. So we had a, a rehearsal and a run of Comedy of Errors in the fall. And uh, now we're in the midst of rehearsing Thunder Knocking on the Door, uh, which will open April 1st. And then it will have a couple of weeks run here at the church. So please come and join us uh, when we're performing. So I thought I would start with um, showing some pictures and speaking a little bit about our work as a company. And then uh, I'm supposed to speak about how we put on a plane. That's a very complicated thing, <laughs> but I will speak uh, to that a little bit later. So let me share my screen. And... And go to here. Okay. So at 10,000 Things Theater, for those of you who don't know our company, um, started about 10 years ago, not 10 years, 30 years ago in 1991. It was founded by um, Michelle Hensley, uh, an amazing woman who worked tirelessly and who had this vision of creating theater that would be accessible to all people. Um, so this is our mission, 10,000 Things Awakens the Creative Spirit of Audiences and Artists by Bringing Essential and Exceptional Theater to People from All Backgrounds and Life Experiences. There's Michelle, and um, I took over the artistic directorship uh, three years ago, so I had been in charge of two seasons before the pandemic hit. Uh, so we had kind of a regular rhythm of producing three plays per year. Uh, and then when the pandemic hit, unlike many theaters around the country, we haven't stopped working because we find we found that we really needed to care for people that were now isolated and they needed inspiration, they needed stories, we needed to keep stories alive. So we've been working really hard through the pandemic, engaging with communities and bringing stories to them and music and just inspiration. 
so our work has become more vital than ever, even though uh, our first live performance was uh, here last fall. Um, so we've been really active. Uh, so there's Michelle uh, in a community center. We perform in all kinds of communities and um, our regular rhythm, because right, I'm just gonna speak a lot about what we often do that we haven't been able to do during the pandemic so that you get an idea of how we work. So half of our shows are for free and in communities. And we go to all kinds of community centers. We go to correctional facilities, uh, senior, senior citizen facilities, homeless shelters. We go to schools. We go to, we go to a lot of different places for free. And then we perform for a paying audience, which allows us to do all this work for the community. So uh, our presentations are, uh, our performance style <clears throat> is in the round where the audience is wrapping the action. The actors are in the middle telling the story. Uh, we don't use uh, any heavy equipment uh, or complicated tech. So we don't use sound, we don't use lights. Uh, and we, we have what I call it an essentialized aesthetic where uh, we use props that define the space and small scenic gestures that allow us to transport the imagination of the audience. And the imagination is very key. Uh, we invite people to imagine places, situations and worlds. Uh, and really actively engage with us as we're performing, as we're telling the story. This also allows the artists to bring their whole selves in telling the story. So their physicality is really important. They can't hide behind anything. They're always visible uh, and they have to figure out a way to be absolutely present in the, in the storytelling and in the acting <clears throat> that they do. Um, this is just a photo of an example of how we use small gestures as scenic pieces to tell the story. This was Fiddler on the Roof, and there's, that's a roof that you're seeing Steve Epp standing on. This was a performance in a library. Imaginative casting. So we often do plays, and we, we want to we really honor our artists and we want to give them opportunities to perform in roles that they, that nobody ever imagines them in. So in the casting, we look for really playful ways where actors can be playing three different roles of different genders, of different status, of different, uh, you know, whether it's dramatic or comedic, for example, Steve Epp, which, who uh, he's a, a, a very a, a wonderful actor in this community. Uh, recently in a performance of Winter Stale, um, he was performing Leontes in the first act, which is this king that makes this horrible mistake. Uh, and in the second act, he was playing a girl at the party and it was like a clown role. And for him to just have, <clears throat> the breath to navigate between these two characters. It was just a wonderful exercise and, and just embraced it fully. Um, I often also talk about the importance of artists in, in our work. Uh, we need actors that are really good at working with each other, at creating an ensemble at uh, creating a team that's gonna go on the road, that's going to pack the van, that's going to uh, share in the labor of packing the van, unpacking the van, setting the, setting the whole space up in a library, in a shelter, wherever it is, and having each other's back. So it's not only they have to be brilliant artists and brilliant actors uh, that are able to suspend the imagination of people that sometimes have never seen people theater in their lives. They've never attended a play in their lives. Um, in now they're suspended in the story and these actors need to keep them engaged. 
but they also have to have each other's backs because unpredictable things happen. The audiences talk back, people get up and come and go. Sometimes we perform in spaces that are uh, not very organized and people are not, the rules of behavior haven't been <laughs> established in a way as to how you see theater. And it's actually really refreshing. And it's actually something that actors really embrace uh, that sense of having to be in their toes and defend their story and defend their play and make it succeed no matter what the circumstances are. So courage is an important ingredient. Um, what this creates also is a sense of wonder in this imaginative casting, for example, we have uh, Rajne Katura here who is, was in the role of uh, Little Red Riding Hood. And the comment and the power that, that it means for an African-American student to see that there's African-American characters in Into the Woods, the possibility that it could be them in the future, to see themselves represented is very, very powerful. So uh, our cast are often very, very diverse. And sometimes in uh, like the play that we're doing right now, Thunder Knocking on the Door is a culturally specific cast because it's a black play uh, set in Bessemer, Alabama, and it's about the blues and these are all blues singers. Uh, so it's an African-American cast. And when I was thinking about the play and where I wanted to take this one specifically, I was thinking about people in correctional facilities where uh, about... 80% of people that are in correctional facilities are African-American. And I was thinking what would give them a sense of uplift, be able to see themselves represented in a joyful, positive way. And that's what Thunder does very vividly. We uh, often, we do, I wanna talk a little bit about the genres of plays that we do. We often do a classic play. This was Henry V. It was an all female cast. Um, we do contemporary plays and we do musicals. And that's not a rule that we cannot break, but that's traditionally the pattern that we follow. Uh, we believe in supporting new writers and inviting new writers into the fold. Uh, we believe in the power of music in order to tell stories. Um, we always work with a live musician that's always present and not always does the music, but also sound effects. What we don't do with lights, we often do with sounds. So we have, you know, knocks on the door or we have uh, different things that happen that allow the imaginative world to, to be creative through sound. So sound is very important. These are, this is a list of some of the communities that we visit. Uh, we have a relationship with Ramsey County Corrections. Uh, we visit both the women and the men there um, as way as, uh, you know, Hub Center for Adult Education, centers where a lot of immigrants are learning English as a second language. And that's been, those have been great relationships. Cora McCorvey of YMCA, um, it's, a, it's a place uh, that, that has been very welcoming to us over the years. So we have deep relationships with some of these communities, Interact Center for the Arts, which is for artists with disabilities. Um, is, is another place that we visit often and we have great friends in, in each of those communities. And Open Book used to be the venue that we used to perform um, historically for years there, but it, with the pandemic it closed and it also became a bit too small for uh, the ease that we, we feel like we need to have both as performers uh, in terms of safety for performers and also safety for our audiences so that they can be a little bit more spread out the way you are right now. These are more uh, communities 
we have, have about 60 partners across Minnesota that we're in contact with and that uh, we have relationships with that have been cultivated over the years. Um, and uh, we reach to different ones at different times with different tours. So we try to spread um, our work uh, in reach as far as we can. This is our van. <laughs> we rent a van. We actually don't own pretty much anything. We don't own space. We don't own a van. We don't have a theater. And we put all our resources into uh, our artists and the work we do. So we often rent what we need. Uh, we're looking into really sustainable practices going forward too, as well. Um, and, uh, but we are in our values, you know, what we really value is, is the support of great actors of the community. So that's where the majority of our dollars go to actually. Here's a photo of Cora McCorvey um, in that's a performance of Thunder, which was just an unbelievable event. Uh, that day actually, this was right before the pandemic, as the pandemic was unfolding, uh, we brought lunch to everybody. So we had a lunch, we served lunch, and then we did the play. And it was just one of the most joyous events I've ever witnessed. So TTT artists, we invite artists in the community that we respect and love to be um, core members of the company. In our company, we have a staff, a small staff of uh, five people. Uh, we have a great board of directors of 12 people. And, uh, and then we have our artist core members. And the artist core members uh, are involved in decisions in strategic planning with the company. They were involved in uh, the selection of the new artistic director. When I came on board, they interviewed me and it was one of the hardest interviews that I had. <laughs> they scrutinized me <laughs> and, uh, and they have their say really matters to us. And that's one of the things that actually inspired me to join 10,000 Things Theater because I always thought that a theater company should put their artists at the center of everything that they do and that they should have a voice and they should have a presence and they shouldn't have a role where they're just jobbed in and jobbed out. Uh, in and kind of forgotten about, but really considered as in the center of everything, in the fabric of everything that we do. So their voice is very important to us and we invite them to board meetings. We invite them to, to be ambassadors for us. Uh, you'll often see them in the reception area. They, they work as volunteers also in, and, um, they help us in all kinds of ways. And during times of you know, upheaval, like in the last two years, uh, they've been really crucial in joining us in conversations as to what do we need to do? Where do we go from here? How do we respond to the current moment? What do you need to sustain yourself? How can you help you sustain yourself? So all those conversations, they have been a really vital part of uh, helping us navigate uh, this moment in time. And these are fantastic artists. Some of the, I wanted to bring some photos of uh, productions we've done. This is the winter still. So you get an idea of the look. The Sins of Sor Juana was a really special one for me in particular. It was a, a, a Sins of Sor Juana was, is, is written by Karen Zacarias and is the story of a Mexican nun in uh, 16th century Mexico. And, uh, and she was a writer who actually in order to have the freedom to create, she uh, had to join a convent. That was the only place where she could just find 
um, the space to do it. And even in the convent, she was greatly repressed because her, uh, her writing was considering, considered at the time too racy for a woman to be expressing herself. So she's an amazing writer and poet, and it was her story. And we took, took this, and it was a very diverse cast. We took it to northern Minnesota, to places that were not very diverse. And I felt like the exchange was incredibly rich and powerful. And even in places where I was thinking, we went to a, a correctional facility called Togo in northern Minnesota, which is a facility that right now is closed, but it, it, uh, it's a facility that uh, had people who are transitioning out into society. So they spend the, the last four months of their term at Togo. And they have very strict discipline there, uh, but they also had access to like go fishing in the woods or learn to fish or learn to do things that uh, would help them in their lives, would help them with their children, learn to, uh, to write a curriculum, to present themselves in ways that they could um, succeed in the outside world. And we had one of the most moving performances in Togo of the sins of Sor Juana. And it really resonated. I think the theme that really resonated there was this feeling of like, wherever you are, even if you're locked, even if the doors are closed and the windows are closed and you don't have possibility, you have your imaginative power. You can imagine how your life will unfold. You can imagine how you can be creative and how you can be how could you, you can contribute to society in positive ways? And that was the gift of Sor Juana. So that, that was a really powerful performance we had there. This is a photo of the Into the Woods. Um, and we, one of the things that we love is actually the comments that our audience <laughs> sends us back. We really treasure that. Uh, we, in, in a lot of our facilities, we cannot sort of codify who's there or what are people thinking. So we try to retrieve comments that we hear uh, and we treasure those. Uh, like here, there would be nothing I could say that would improve the quality and perfection of the cast. They own their roles, they are believable. They tell their own story with such grace and emotion. Our values, and I'm just gonna sip quickly through these. Um, theater is better when everyone is in the audience, performing for audiences of all life experiences and backgrounds expands imagination and challenges us to create work that is honest, relevant, and representative. Artistic excellence drives our work. We combine rigor, skilled artists, and bold universal stories to create the best work possible. Artists are our greatest asset. We value the tremendous talent and commitment of our artists and place them at the center of the work. Everyone belongs. We actively work to eliminate barriers to participation and cultivate equitable practices. Whether an audience member, artist, staff, or volunteer, each person's unique perspective is necessary to the work. We choose joy, and this is very important. Challenging work is best met by an environment that allows for laughter, safety, play, and creativity. So I mentioned this before, our model, or our financial model, where the donors, you know, through the generosity of our donors, we can uh, offer all this work for free and also compensate fairly the artists that work for us. One of the things that Michelle started, this was before the pandemic, um, she wanted to expand the work nationally. 
And since touring is so expensive and, and hard to do, she decided to teach her mo the model of 10,000 things to different theaters that were interested uh, across the country. So now if you hear of like the public theater in New York, they have a mobile unit that's become a really important part of their work. Uh, it was uh, thanks to TTT that the mobile unit was started. Uh, so there's many th important theaters across the country now that they have a wing uh, like 10,000 Things Theater and that are using um, our model to uh, reach their communities. So what's coming up, when you, what you can see right now, we still have up and running at 10,000 voices. Um, that leads me to think about all the activities that we've been doing during the pandemic. When the pandemic hit, the first thought in my mind was like, how can we help? Who needs help? Who needs the most help? We've all had a hard time. Uh, but people in senior communities were tremendously isolated at that time, and people in correctional facilities, they continue to be tremendously isolated and in lockdowns uh, all the time. So they, they can spend 20 hours in a cell without the ability to go out to a patio or anything like that. So they they've had a really rough go during the pandemic. So that sparked us to create this new program for us called 10,000 Voices that we're very excited about. And what we've done is to send prompts to these facilities through our partners and uh, invite them to write and invite them to share with us their own writing. So they've wrote, written letters, they've written poems, and they've, we've shared this uh, virtually through virtual programs uh, read by professional actors, and this is our second year of 10,000 Voices. So we still have a program up and running that we did recently, and that was offered uh, through video virtually. And Thunder Knocking on the Door is coming uh, soon <laughs> to this space, of course. And one new thing in the pandemic, too, is we just used media to the extent that we could in order to reach communities and support artists. Um, so we are offering everything uh, virtually as well. So we're working with video artists that come and capture the work. Uh, so people that have a choice to either come to the, to the space, to the theatrical space, or they can watch from their home um, a video version of the work. So that has really, we've branched out just in, in an effort to be inclusive and to be uh, considerate of people's comfort level in coming together and getting comfortable being in live theater. So uh, this is a photo of our cast as, as we were having to close very suddenly, I mean, the, the close down of the pandemic was we were just starting our paid performances at Open Book and we performed on a Thursday and on Friday we had to close uh, the show. And, but we got together one more time, as you see here, to say goodbye and have a quick <laughs> toast <laughs> as we parted. And it was, uh, this, of course, was a very bittersweet, very hard moment for us because we had worked so hard in this production and we had to let it go and we were not certain of what was going to happen. Um, so coming back to Thunder is very symbolic of a journey that we've all gone through, the pandemic. Uh, have, we, have we endured? Have we helped each other? In, in how we come back strong, resilient, and trying to spread joy at this moment that uh, where we need it most. It's a photo of uh, thunder knocking on the door. The, the, the person in front is uh, Brian Bose, who's also the choreographer, and he's brilliant. More thunder. So this is a really unique 
show for me, very dear to my, my heart. It's, um, it was done at the Guthrie Theater in the 90s. So some of you may remember that version of the show. It works very differently in the format that we're doing it with audience all around, with the actors in the middle of the action. Most of the play takes place in uh, the Dupree family household. So we're really witnessing a, a living room life and family dynamics. And this is a really wonderful family. And coming back to this play, uh, what really resonates to me is how much love there is, how the, these familial relationships go so deep, how they have each other's back and they'll fight for each other. Uh, but they have an encounter with a mythical character, with Thunder, and Thunder is coming for a guitar duel. And Thunder is a mythical character. He's a shapeshifter, so he's not mortal. So is the, the playwright took this fairy tale and this myth of, uh, that's based on the real life story of uh, Robert Johnson, who disappeared for some time. He, apparently he didn't use, he, he wasn't a great guitar player, but then he disappeared. And when he came back, he was a brilliant guitar player. So people created this myth that he had made a pact with the devil and that he had sold his soul at the crossroads. And that's how he could play so well. Uh, so the play riffs on that story. Um, the character of Thunder is not like the devil at all. <laughs> uh, he's got his real reasons to do what he's doing. He's not evil in any way, but he's uh, responsible for carrying on the tradition of the blues. And he has given his soul in order to carry that tradition. So whoever has that role will carry on the tradition of the blues. Um, so the play is funny, is, is, is very fast moving. The music is unbelievably good. Um, it was composed by Kep Ma and Anderson Edwards. And if you know Kep, Kep Ma's music is just fantastic. Uh, so it's just a really special play, and it's a play that releases us into joy. And that's a powerful thing for these performers uh, who are African-American, who have also gone through really hard circumstances in this last couple of years, and who are often asked to do plays that are um, uh, what what they called, you know, re-traumatizing plays where they have to revisit a lot of trauma in the community and in, specifically in the Black community. And this play doesn't. This play is a celebration of life, a celebration of culture, and a celebration of joy in music. And we've been talking a lot about music, the power of music. And T. Michael Rambo said the other day to me, um, you know, in, in some places in Africa, there's no word for music because music is just part of life. So it doesn't need a word. It's like the air we breathe. So it's, it, the, the fabric of this music is so woven into the play. It's just a really amazing experience. So in putting on this play, which was what I was supposed to talk about, <laughs> Nowadays, I have to say, it's very hard to put on a play because, they, because of the COVID coordinates, right? We can't do plays in the same way. We can't be too close together. We have to take care of the safety of our cast. We have a lot, a lot of union rules that take care of that, that we need to abide by. So we have um, a COVID officer, for example, in rehearsals. We have testing three times a week, um, cost, constantly testing, which I don't mind at all. Uh, but that's just part of what we do. All actors are being tested three times a week. Um, for the first time, we have understudies. So we have three extra actors that can step on for other actors in case somebody's out and ill. Um, there's... Um, 
of course, we have to be careful with surfaces. We have to be cleaning everything. We're still in the world of like extreme COVID precautions uh, and these are union rules. Uh, we're not allowed to tour. So we're not allowed to go to our communities. And that's why the media is so important to us because we reach to them uh, through video and through media and we invite them to participate that way and the people that can come to us. And we're also inviting them to join us here and to join us at the Capri Theater, which is where it, it will uh, be running as well. So it's, it's not an easy thing to produce. Uh, also, you know, people have been in, <laughs> in, lock, in, in some kind of internal process with themselves. We've all been isolated in some shape or form. And coming back to having the skills you need to perform several days a week or to rehearse several days a week, or maybe you've had COVID and you have lingering symptoms of COVID. Uh, I find that the kindness and generosity that we have and the patience that we have to have for each other in the room is really paramount uh, right now. And this involves all the whole team. We've added a lot of people to our teams, like the COVID officer, um, like uh, we, we're adding some sound technology in order because we're performing in bigger spaces. So we want to make sure that the audience hears really well. So we're using uh, microphones and sound, not to so much as to amplify the sound, but just to make it clear. Uh, and to have the right balance of acoustics. Um, and we've added, of course, our video teams uh, who are fantastic artists on their own right and who do incredible work with very fast turnaround. So our teams have really, really grown um, because we have to, because it's what we need to do uh, in place of what we used to do at, at, you know, before the pandemic hit. Okay, great. So any questions? <laughs> yes. St. Peter? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we start, our performances start at the Capri. I think we open here one day, then we go to the Capri, and then we come back here for a couple of weeks. So we'll be running between April 1st and May 8th. So we'll have five weeks of shows. Yes. Most of the cast is the same except for one person, the role of... Uh, uh, Good Sister Dupree is played by Tomasina Petrus this time around, and she's amazing. So she's, uh, if you know Tomasina and her singing, she's just a star. So, so we're very fortunate that everybody said yes. And one of the things I heard, one of the things we did with the pandemic too, is when we closed, uh, According to union rules, we only had to like pay two months, I mean, sorry, two weeks of salary to the actors because this was an act of God or such. But we decided to honor our contracts in full. So we paid our actors to the end of their contracts. And then we paid the next production. Also, we paid our actors to the end of their contracts because they're suddenly out of work. And, and if we value artists, we're going to value their livelihood. And I think that that also creates um, in them a sense when I call them to say, can you do Thunder again? Uh, they all said yes readily because they were very grateful and then we had respected their, their time and their life and supported them at a time where other theaters were not. Yes. There's a couple of questions. 
thank you so much for this uh, presentation today. It's been really, really interesting. Um, I was, we were fortunate enough to see a production of 10,000 Things uh, here at Plymouth probably 10 years ago, maybe a bit more. Um, and it was presented in Guild Hall, or uh, the common space that we use oftentimes. Um, I'm curious, um, will you be playing in the theater, uh, in the Howard Kahn Theater, or will you be playing in uh, an, an open space where the audience can surround you again? Yeah, we're, we're playing back at Guild Hall with audiences all around. It's going to be a little bit more roomy, and that's why Guild Hall is a good place for us, because it has enough space that people can spread out a bit. So we don't have to be too close or too intimate. And, and as I explained, we're using sound design in order to control the sound in that big room as well, which sometimes can be a challenge. But uh, yeah, we're looking forward to a run there. Very good. And then uh, the other question I had, did the Paycheck Protection Act help you at all during the time that the theater had to be closed? It certainly did. Uh, and what I was listening the other day, the, we, we did get um, a round of PPP loans. So that was very helpful for us to keep functioning. Uh, we did not get the shattered, there was another loan of shattered venues and that didn't apply to us, but it, that applied more readily to uh, theaters that went completely dark, that closed their doors and didn't produce uh, which I was thinking, you know, here we are producing. <laughs> we don't get the shattered venues because we're working, <laughs> but we did get the PPP loan and that was very helpful. Um, I just wonder if tickets are on sale already and uh, do we just go to www10,000 things? 10,000 things.org. Yes. They're on sale now. They're on sale now. Good. Yeah. yeah couple of questions up here. Um, do you get grant or other funding to help cover your free programs? Yeah, we get, uh, I mean, Minnesota is a great place for the artistic community in general because of the legacy grant. Um, the, the, and I don't know if you are familiar with that, but it, that was, uh, um, an amendment that was passed some years back where taxpayers said, yes, you can use part of the sales tax in the arts or the environment in Minnesota. So therefore, uh, there's funding through the Minnesota State Arts Boards for the artistic community. And we get funded through the Minnesota State Arts Board yearly. Uh, and there's also a wonderful fund foundations like the Good Foundation, uh, the McKnight Foundation, and others that fund our work, as well as the NEA, which is uh, the National Endowment for the Arts. So we do. Wow. Um, and that was from John Humphrey. He has, he has several more questions. Um, any stories you can share of when the audience talked back? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Well, particularly in corrections, uh, I think the men or the groups of men and women have no problem joking back. And sometimes they can derail the performance or their comment becomes part of the play in a way. Uh, and that's why skilled actors and skilled at improvisation is really important, you know, to have those skills to respond, make light of it, and continue going on with a story. So uh, actors don't ignore participation, but welcome it in those cases. Um, and I remember watching this gentleman in a correctional facility that was kind of in a row way in the back. And he was I watched him so intently because he was fascinated with all the backstage business. You know, whenever an actor left the stage and they would go on and change a costume or grab a prop or they'd be running around backstage and then they would come come in as a different character. He was just laughing and chuckling and finding that so funny. <laughs> he was so delighted by the exercise that the actors were doing. 
And of course, you know, in a setting like that, it's just so surreal to have these grown up people playing character and playing make believe and changing clothes and, and just doing it in a really skilled way. Um, there was a one anecdote that a colleague of mine also tells a lot about uh, one time that 10,000 Things did a little shop of horrors. And there's a scene there where there's this cruel dentist that's going to go beat his girlfriend. And he, he doesn't really beat her on stage, but it's, a, it's an aggressive, violent scene. And he's going towards her. And then one of the women, this was in Shakopee Corrections, one of the women just put her hand, you know, right in front of her as to protect her, like we're going to take care of it. And that was a very, not funny moving, but very moving moment where you see women that have gone through this, you know, whose life experience, I mean, in correctional facilities, there's a lot of women that are victims of violence that ended up there because of it, you know, in some way or another. And, um, and they were just going to defend, you know, the female character. So it's, it becomes very vivid and very immediate. Um, do you partner with any senior centers? And they, um, we have a, um, we go often to Episcopal homes, um, and others, but that's the one, you know, from when I joined TTT, we've, uh, we've gone many times to Episcopal homes. They know us, they expect us, uh, we're familiar to them. There's a hall where we always perform and they just love theater. They're one of our greatest audiences. Any other questions? Timing is excellent as always. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's really a pleasure to have you. It's been a delight. Come and see Thunder. <laughs> You'll love it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I also want to let everyone know that next Sunday, the direct, executive director of Hennepin County History Museum will be speaking about um, their current programs, their and future programs, as well as, you know, just the power of our local history. So hopefully